Harold, you are the 13th Arthur Goodhart Visiting Professor of Legal Science to be interviewed for the Inland Scholars Archive. You're currently the Sterling Professor of International Law at Yale Law School, a position that you've held since 2013. You've been the Goodhart Professor for the academic year 2018 to 19, and we are very grateful for your agreeing to share some reminiscences of your life and career and your experiences here in Cambridge over this period. I hope you can also give us some thoughts on legal topics in international law. So could we start with your early life? You were born in Boston on December the 8th, 1954, and this was 16 months after the end of the Korean War. Your father was originally from what is North Korea, but he escaped to the United States. Can you tell us a little about your parents, how they came to the States, and re-established themselves there? Uh, yeah, so um, actually it was my mother who's from North Korea. Um, uh, my parents are the inspiration of my life. Uh, my father's an international law professor, which explains why I'm an international law professor. His name was Kwang Lim Ko, um, and he was from a very small island uh, off the south coast of South Korea. So he was as south as you could get. It's called Cheju Island. It's a fishing, <coughs> it's a fishing village, and uh, he was a, an incredibly hardworking student, uh, and was the first student from the island ever to go to Seoul, which was uh, an astonishing. It'd be like someone from the the uh, Isle of Wight coming to London. Um, at the time, the the uh, uh, Seoul National University was controlled by the Japanese colonial forces. And so what he attended was called Keijo Imperial University, where he was the only Korean with one other fellow. And they were very heavily discriminated against. But my father took this as a challenge and was uh, number one in the class, even though he was the only one of the only two Koreans. Um, and uh, this created this incredible drive for achievement, really, to, to prove that uh, Koreans could not be looked down upon. Uh, my mother, who my dad passed away in 1989, um, he did not escape to America. He came as a student. Uh, in fact, we just found <laughs> the materials. He got a scholarship from an educational institution in Princeton, New Jersey, which he misunderstood. This was in, in 1949. He misunderstood to mean he was being admitted to Princeton University to study law. Uh, Princeton doesn't have a law school. So he came all the way to America, went to Princeton, and they said, we don't have a law school. So he enrolled in a PhD program at nearby Rutgers University in New Jersey, got a PhD. He then went to Harvard Law School, got a master's LLM, and then got an SJD. Uh, and then finally, just to establish that he could practice law in America, he got a JD degree from Boston College Law School. Um, and I'll say more about this in a moment, but his specialty was law of the sea and uh, particularly the, the study of fisheries. Um, next week, I'm arguing at the International Court of Justice about, among other things, Russia's theft of fisheries from Ukraine. So it, it's coming uh, full circle in some way. I'm finally, I realized my father had a vision that uh, was uh, just very far reaching. Uh, now, my mother, Heisung Chun Ko, is from a very different walk of life. She's from a very well to do family in Seoul. Um, she is still alive. Uh, when I get back from Cambridge, we'll have her 90th birthday. Uh, she gave birth to six children, she has her own PhD. Um, she is the head of a research institute on uh, uh, Koreans and Korean Americans, and she's a sociologist. Um, and my parents were the first uh, Asians ever to teach law at Yale Law School, uh, where they did in 1961. And um, my sister and I are now chaired professors at Yale Law School many years later. So. Uh, but what happened was that my mother's family um, had a summer home in North Korea, uh, which is a very cool, mountainous part of the country. And when the country was divided by 
uh, after after the end of World War II, they were happened to be up there her herself and her two siblings, and was actually trapped inside North Korea for uh, three or four months, um, and the Russians were in control and. Um, she was recounting to me just very recently that when the Russians came marching down, uh, they didn't know what to do, so they held up a sign, you're supposed to welcome them. She didn't like the Russians, so she put up a sign that said, welcome allied forces. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, she was advised that, uh, uh, you know, she was 17 years old, that um, the Russian forces were raping and molesting young Korean women. So after several months, she dressed up as a boy, and she and her two brothers hiked to the border. And my father, my grandfather, who I never met, her father, sent a car to meet them. When they got to the border, there was no car, and uh, uh, then they just waited there for uh, ten ten hours or something. And suddenly, a car appeared and took her south. Um, amazingly, a few months later, she. Uh, went to America on a scholarship uh, to Dickinson College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Um, as a freshman, um, the war started, Korean War started, and Dickinson College is very close to the Army War College. And they sent a kind of distress signal saying, does anyone speak Korean? Because our generals need to know how to speak Korean. So my mother went over there as a freshman, she was 18 years old, and started teaching them Korean language. And then a few weeks later, she said to them, you know, you can't learn Korean language without learning Korean history, and you can't learn Korean history without learning Korean culture. And so I want to teach these courses, and you can't do any of it without knowing Korean geography. So she taught all of these courses as a fresher. Um, so she is an, a remarkable person, as you can tell. Um, and so my parents were among the only two Koreans uh, in the East Coast under the Japanese, I'm sorry, under the, the Korean Normalization Act. I think there were less than a thousand in the mainland of America as opposed to Hawaii. Uh, and then by incredible coincidence, um, the, my father's dissertation advisor at Rutgers went to Dickinson where my mother was a student to give a speech and my mother was his tour guide. And so uh, he went back and told my father, there's this remarkable Korean woman at not so far from here. Um, so my father began writing her letters and proposing marriage and things like this, <laughs> sight unseen. <laughs> um, and uh, and uh, uh, eventually she agreed to a meeting and then they got married. And, uh, I'm the fourth uh, child of six. And <laughs> what, what an incredible trajectory. Well, I think there are a couple of things you can get from that. One is uh, I'm, I'm an optimistic person, I think, uh, by, by my history. You know, I, um, it's, it's a miraculous story, uh, really. Uh, in fact, I'll tell a little bit more if it's not too much. Uh, the pivotal moment of my father's career came in, uh, he was at Harvard Law School, and um, Syngman Rhee's government, uh, which was uh, sort of an American, uh, being propped up by the Americans, collapsed. And my father's friend, uh, John Chung, was the ambassador from Korea to Washington, wanted to run for prime minister. And my father was so popular in the south of Korea, that Chang asked my father to go back and campaign for him. But um, uh, my father didn't have any money. and uh, But he had just joined the church at Harvard Law School, right? It's right next to Harvard Law School. And so the minister of the church said to my parents, um, okay, uh, on Sunday, we'll tell you to leave the church and just take your family and walk out. So he did, and uh, a few minutes later, he came out and gave us several thousand dollars. He had, he had just called for the congregation to donate money so that this young patriot could go back to 
Korea. So my father goes back, uh, they win the election, and he suddenly was offered every position. He was sort of the young star of the government. He then agreed to be the first ambassador to the UN, but um, and he was only 40 years old. Um, uh, the Korea was an observer nation. So then they said, we would like you to be the number two guy in Washington, the uh, charge d'affaires. And this was the ideal position for my father. The year was uh, 1960. Uh, John Kennedy had just been elected. And my father was uh, constantly over at the White House. And everybody at the White House was somebody he knew from Harvard. And he was having the time of his life. And then uh, and we were living in Washington, D.C., the whole, whole family. One day, he, uh, my mother gets a call, and my father's at Dulles Airport. And he says to her, what I was worried about is happening. I'm going back to Korea. And it turned out he had been warned that the Korean government would be overthrown by a military dictatorship. And so he flew back and warned Chang, his, his, uh, his mentor and boss. And Chang said, no, no, General Park, uh, Park Chung-hee will prevent this from happening. A few days later, G General Park himself committed the coup and they were all thrown out. By this point, my father was back in America and he convened the meeting of um, everybody at the embassy. And he said, uh, everyone must take a pledge. We will never serve a dictatorship. We will only serve a democracy that's governed by the rule of law. And everybody signed the pledge. And within a year, everybody broke the pledge except for my father. And he was exiled and he never served in the government again. But he told me the story countless times. And his main point was that many people profess to care about the rule of law, but it's it's really kind of a, um, uh, but they're weak-willed and um, uh, when push comes to shove, they don't live their commitments. Then the other amazing thing that happens, and then I'll end this little account, is that um, my father heard that Chang, his boss, would be executed uh, and was under house arrest. So he went to the White House to see the Deputy National Security Advisor, who is a man named uh, Walt W. Rostow, famous uh, economist. And uh, Rostow said to him, we know where Mr. Chang is. He will not be harmed. And my father was just staggered by the reach of American power that this guy sitting in Washington could say this with certainty about something happening on the other side of the world. Uh, and then when it was over, um, and also I think he, he was stunned by what he thought was the goodness of American power. You know, obviously America's power has had many faces, but this gave my father a deep love of America, which I think everybody in my family shares that, um, there's a, a good America, and then there's a not so good America, but we have to keep calling America to its uh, better angels. At the very end of the conversation, almost proving this, um, what Rostow says to my father, uh, what are you doing now? And my father says, I'm, I'm exiled and I'm unemployed and uh, I, I have six children. And uh, Rostow says, don't, don't you teach law? And my father says, uh, yes. And he says, well, you know, my brother is dean of Yale Law School, uh, Eugene Rostow, let me call him. <laughs> so yeah, he picks up the phone and they have a very short conversation. According to my father, the conversation lasted maybe 10 seconds. And he, he couldn't hear what he said. <clears throat> and my father just assumed that um, nothing had happened. So he was getting ready to leave. And then Rostov said, where are you going? And my father said, um, I guess it, it didn't work out. And he said, no, no, no. He said, uh, my brother said, can you get here in a week? And a week later, we moved to New Haven. 40 years later, I was dean of Yale Law School. So <laughs> that's, 
So from the, these strands come a couple of things. You know, first, I think uh, this belief in human rights, that we have to fight for human rights. Second, um, that we have to be committed to the rule of law. Third, that we have to call America. American citizens have to call America to its better angels. Um, and um, finally, that... Uh, you know, there's a generous approach to life and a less generous approach to life. And, you know, if, if you're lucky enough to be the beneficiary, uh, then you have to take that generous approach to others. And um, so I've tried to live by those ideas, not you know, imperfectly, but, uh, the <laughs> but um, that, that's been the case. Now, there's a very interesting connection to good heart, which is when I was growing up in New Haven, Connecticut, my... Uh, Dad wanted my brother to get into a local boys' school, and it turned out the only way you could get in was to be recommended by someone who had gone to that school. And there was a guy, a uh, young professor, Guido Calabresi, and my father went to him and asked him, uh, would you recommend my sons, my brother, to the school, which he did. And then he recommended each of us, and that's how we went. Years later, I was Guido's colleague and then succeeded him as the dean of the law school. But um, it was uh, Guido who said to me, the best year I ever had was my year at Cambridge as the Goodhart professor at Trinity Hall. And that's when it sort of came into my mind, gee, I'd like to be the Goodhart professor someday. <laughs> <laughs> and my other colleague, John Langbein, also had a similar experience at uh, Trinity Hall. So um, anyway, that's how I that's how I got here. Thank you very much.